Again, thank you very much. My name is Jason Dick. I'm the Capitol Hill editor at Roll Call, um, Capitol Hill resident too. So this is kind of nice being in, in this, this great uh, facility here. Um, tonight, we've got Mark Halperin, uh, author, a co-author of Double Down, uh, Game Change 2012, and Christina Bellantoni, editor-in-chief of Roll Call. Uh, Christina and Mark have also actually been on the trail uh, at, at the same time together, so they have some shared experiences from the, uh, the previous campaign. Uh, and I just wanted to say a couple of things about, about the book before we start our discussion with, with Mark, and that's that uh, one of the things that Christina and I were talking about uh, about the book is you know, th there are so many books that come out every campaign trail. I mean, you know, we I, I get them as the Capitol Hill editor, and Game Change and Double Down probably are, are are two of the books that are the most read and engaged among the people who are interested in politics. And we were thinking about what are, what might be the reasons for that, and you know, the, the reasons that we go into politics, or the reasons we go into journalism. And we, we thought, well, you know, actually the reason that we went into journalism and moved to Washington and got into politics is not because we wanted to be hated by the rest of the country. Uh, it, it was actually because it's fun. Uh, it, it, it's fun, there's a human element to it. Uh, th this is, these are some of the big questions that you pursue when you're looking at politics and why people run and want, why people want to run things. And this is one of the things that is reflected very well uh, in particularly in Double Down, there there is a there is a humor to it. There's a there's a touch of humanity to the characters, uh, and that's one of the things that I th I think that uh, it com comes through quite well. And with that, I think that's a nice transition to one of Christina's questions. Hi everybody, thanks for being here. Um, yes, Mark and I, in fact, were seatmates on the Obama plane in 2008, uh, many a turn, and uh, just like Jason said, I was fascinated by by Game Change and obviously Double Down as well. And we're going to talk a lot about different candidates that might be running now again in 2016, but I'd like to start with President Obama because for us, we really try to understand how he interacts with Congress. How does he get at achieving anything in his agenda? The Affordable Care Act was a major component of that. That was sort of the one crowning achievement of his first term. How do you see his relationship with Congress and what you particularly saw as he approached running for a second term, and how did that affect what's happening today? All right, that's a lot um, <laughs> for the first question, not warming me up. Uh, thank you both, very kind words about the book. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I love uh, coming to DC, uh, although I don't live here. I, I grew up in Bethesda, uh, but uh, when I became the political director of ABC News back in uh, 1997, I asked my bosses if rather than covering politics from uh, inside the Beltway, I could live on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, I told them I wanted to be more in touch with the real lives of real people. Um, <laughs> and amazingly, they bought that. So I live in New York, but I travel a lot. Uh, I've covered politics in 49 of 50 states, and, and I do like coming here occasionally to un try to understand what's going on. Um, the, uh, the president's relationship with Congress is just a huge topic that has been written about by Roll Call, and we write about it in the book. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's been one of the biggest issues of his campaign, of his presidency. When uh, uh, I heard a story not that long ago um, about a, uh, a Democratic senator who um, was complaining uh, in a small group, a uh, pretty prominent Democratic senator, that um, he rarely heard from President Obama. Uh, and he said, um, he said, uh, he, since, since, and he's a chair of a committee, he said, since I've become chair, the president has called me a total of two times. And one of the other people at the table said, Sh you shouldn't say that so loud because there are a lot of Democrats who've been called less than that. And they'd be upset that, um, that you've been called two times. Um, it is, it is the case that if you did a focus group of Republican members and Democratic members, their critique of the president's relationship with Congress the state of it and why it's the way it is would be almost identical. And in a city and a, and, a, and a legislative body where the parties rarely agree on anything, that's quite striking, that they would agree that the president hasn't reached out, that he's had people running legislative affairs at times who haven't um, been um, as sensitive to their needs as, uh, as they would like, that uh, on the Republican side that he's done almost nothing to build ties to Speaker Boehner uh, or um, uh, Leader McConnell. And that um, in the context of both um, uh, his real act and until recently, the midterms, he has um, seemed much more focused on his own political future and, and prospects than he has on his parties. Um, in the book, we write about um, the, um, uh, the fact that his legislative agenda um, uh, after the Affordable Care Act passed and the, and the um, 
and some of the other things he did in his first two years in office, dealing with the auto industry, dealing with the stimulus, dealing with financial re-regulation, that he got very little done and spent most of uh, not just the election year 2012, but 2011, which we write about a fair amount in the book, not trying to pass anything, but trying to prepare for re-election so that he could um, win. And as he said, the fever would break in his calculation, and he'd be able to work with Congress and get things done because he'd have a, a renewed mandate after being reelected. That has worked out on some issues, had budget, had spending bill, had uh, farm bill. But the big things that are the president's priorities that have been his priorities since he first ran and that all remain his priorities in this term, immigration reform, climate change, energy, uh, tax reform, uh, implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and um, uh, and uh, some things on tra worker training and education, those remain undone. And because of his relationship with Congress, I think at this point, barring some, some uh, unforeseen major event, I think it's difficult to see how he changes things. When he first got reelected, there was a period that most everybody here will recall uh, where he did reach out. He had some dinners with Republican senators, and um, and he and he seemed to think seemed to uh, be on a different path. Th those have ended, uh, and as we write about in the book, I'll just conclude by saying the president um, uh, is an extraordinarily gifted guy. He got elected twice, president of the United States. Uh, under tough circumstances in both cases. There's no doubt that he's a great politician. Uh, but there are two things about him that I think are true that, that have most directly impacted what are not particularly good relationships with Congress. One is he only does, in any given case, what he perceives he needs to do and no more. Now, I'm extraordinarily sympathetic to that because I'm pretty much the same way. <laughs> I do just what I need to do and no more. But sometimes you, you misjudge what it, is, what it is that's enough to achieve what you want. And the other is... He likes the people he likes, and he doesn't much like people he doesn't like, and he's not very good at faking it. He's got a poker face about some things, but, you know, he famously made a joke about McCon Leader McConnell at a White House Correspondents' Dinner um, uh, where, you know, someone said, you know, he said, I get the advice, you know, why don't you have uh, a drink with Mitch McConnell? And his reaction to that is, why don't you have a drink with Mitch McConnell? You know, he, he, he's, he's openly contemptuous of a lot of the Republicans. And, and, you know, they've been openly contemptuous of him. So uh, there's a certain amount of shared responsibility. But I think the, the, um, uh, the president has not put in the time to build the kind of personal relationships that politics, pretty much any business requires. And we're seeing the effects of that. They don't, they don't fear him and they don't really like him. And that makes it difficult not just Republicans, but a lot of Democrats as well. And on the flip side of that, you write about, of course, Uncle Joe, Vice President Joe Biden, who loved being in the Senate and made this body really part of his sort of core yeah. belief system. He's very different. He had been used as the liaison to Capitol Hill. You're not seeing that as much anymore. How do you think that's going to play out as he continues to decide whether he's going to run for president yeah. in 2016? You know, I would, if I were cloned, I would have my clone just cover Joe Biden full time. I just, there's really in my career, there's no one I've enjoyed covering more. I, he's, he's just, he's just a great guy. He's entertaining. And, um, and I have a lot of respect for him. And, and I've been, but uh, maybe not as hurt as he's been by how the Uncle Joe thing and how people perceive him as kind of a bumbler. Um, but I've been surprised by it as he has because he doesn't see himself that way. You know, he's chairman of foreign relations, chairman of judiciary, vice president of the United States, an extraordinarily accomplished guy, a great fingertip feel. You know, we write in the book about his, his view of his own political skills, and he thinks he, he, as Joe Biden would say, he literally thinks he's as good a politician as Bill Clinton. Um, now, maybe some you could take exception with that, but that gives you a sense of the frame of mind he has. He was uh, uh, used on some pretty key negotiations. There's this, sometimes this misapprehension that he and Mitch McConnell are friends from the Senate. They're not. They don't really even like each other, but they can do business. They know they have a you know a nose for where the where the deal lies and how to get there. Um, but largely, as I understand it, because uh, Leader Reid has not appreciated some of the deals that have come out of uh, Biden's involvement in, in brokering deals, uh, he's, he's largely been sidelined. I think that the, the, the story of his time as vice president from here to the end of this term is going to be a fascinating one as he grapples with whether to run and whether he's able to run or not, the relevance that he can have he doesn't want to spend the balance of the term doing nothing. Uh, 
he's always going to have a big role in foreign policy. And of course, as president's second terms wind down, foreign policy comes to the fore. And with recent developments, that's definitely true. So he's got that. But in terms of domestic policy, congressional relations, a, a, a visible national role, um, a, a big role in 2014 for, for candidates, I think that remains to be seen. I'm strongly of the belief that he will not run if Hillary Clinton runs. Um, I think the only way to run against her sensibly is to really go after her. And these are two people uh, who really like each other. Uh, in fact, we report in the book that they um, would often end phone calls with each other by saying, I love you. Now, that is very uncommon in politics. Like, <laughs> not, not even the Cheney sisters end their calls that way. So, <laughs> so there's a, there's a, there's a personal thing there, but there's also the reality that you'd have to run against her as an insurgent. He is not, you know, judiciary and, and our foreign relations are not great fundraising committees. So he's never had the kind of national fundraising base that a chair would normally have. They're probably the last two committees you'd want to chair if you wanted to build that, that Rolodex up. And so he'd have to run as a sitting vice president in an insurgent campaign against a close friend of his where she's got a lock on every constituency in the party. So. If she doesn't run, and, I, and I'm one who, who thinks she might not more than most of our colleagues, but if she doesn't run, I think he, I think the story of the Democratic nomination is how formidable a front runner is he, if at all. Uh, if she does run, I think he, he's going to have a, 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 a relatively low profile balance of his term. Well, you know, she's absolutely frozen the field. Um, even the most active Democrats like Martin O'Malley, who, who are thinking about running if she doesn't, aren't doing very much by the standards of the last couple cycles. Occasional trips to early states, meeting with donors when they can, but nothing like what, what, what you would expect if she weren't there. And, and her, her uh, super PACs are doing more than everybody else combined in both parties in terms of donors and grassroots. So he's got time, and, and, and like I said, if she doesn't run, he starts as the front runner, but I think he would quickly be overtaken by a lot of people because he doesn't have very much built up and there is the Uncle Joe syndrome. I have been stunned. I would say since the president was reelected, the political development that has stunned me the most is the absolute lack of enthusiasm of him as a candidate, even if she doesn't run, amongst people who like him, who know him. They just they do not see him as even the obvious alternative to her, let alone, you could imagine a world where some people would say, given his role in the administration and given the, some of the baggage she has, he's a preferred choice, but that is not the case. On the other side of the aisle with, with the Republicans, one thing that we discussed when, when we were just uh, talking about your book. Behind about, my back. Yeah, <laughs> behind yeah. your back. Uh, well, actually, in our discussion, uh, when, when, uh, when we first contacted you about, about doing the, it was about the Mitt Romney um, documentary that mm -hmm. had come out. And you'd seen it, and you'd, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd said that, like, that you would have loved to have had some of that same access, but that it actually comports a little bit with, your, uh, with, with what you had observed mm -hmm. uh, on, on the trail. Um, this is someone who hasn't 100% ruled out a third run <laughs> for the White House. Uh, and then there's also this little, you know, kind of what is Jeb going to do kind of syndrome. Do you, do you think that the, fro the, the, the Republican field is, is similarly frozen, waiting for what Jeb Bush is doing, waiting for what Mitt Romney might do? Yeah. It's not similarly frozen uh, because she truly freezes it. And I think you see people like Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio and... Um, uh, Rand Paul doing stuff far more extensive than what Martin O'Malley is doing. Um, the Republican Party in the modern era, post-Reagan, post has always had by now in the, this part of the cycle a obvious front runner who's an establishment figure who becomes the nominee. They get scared, greater or lesser scares, you know, other establishment or non-establishment people get in, but in the end they're the nominee. There's no one like that now. Um, I, I see the field the following way. First of all, deal with Governor Romney. You know, he's asked in every interview, are you thinking of running? He's been, I wouldn't say Sherman-esque, but pretty close to it. Sherman-esque is meaningless. I'll remind you that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama both ruled out running in the years they ran. They absolutely ruled it out. And there are ways to, you know, obviously ways to get around that and win. So I don't pay much attention to headlines that I see on a regular basis after these interviews. Romney rules out a run. You know, it's meaningless. In, in Romney's world, on paper, he is the strongest candidate right now. He's got the best fundraising apparatus. He's got name ID. He's got experience. He's an establishment figure. Perhaps 
after two times intending to run as the um, centrist Mr. Fixit from a blue state, he'd remember that's the way he wants to run and do it and, and perhaps win. Um, but, uh, and there are people around him. I mean, literally the last three conversations I've had on general matters with people very close to Mitt Romney, all three of them said to me, so do you think he ought to run? Which to me means, translation, I think he ought to run from their point of view. So here's how I believe, and this is based not just on my gut, but on reporting. Here's how I believe Governor Romney sees it. There must be a strong establishment candidate because whether Hillary Clinton's a nominee or not, the party will nominate an establishment person and that person has the best chance of winning. The Tea Party's influence is lower now than it was in the year they nominated Mitt Romney. Uh, there aren't that many establishment candidates out there who could actually do this. I believe that the, the tier who could do it would it, are Hillary Clinton, uh, sorry, Jeb Bush, uh, Governor Christie, if he comes through this unscathed, um, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, and John Kasich, if he's reelected. Uh, we can talk about people like Scott Walker, who I think is overrated, a nice guy and an and, and a, and a accomplished person, but I don't think is close to ready to, to take on the Clintons. I just don't see that. But I think the other four are. And, um, and it's possible that none of them will run. And if none of them run, I could see Governor Romney running. I could see him uh, 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 moving towards this late if no one, no one runs. I think Jeb is at the top of the list. Um, of the of the four of them, and I include Governor Romney in there. Uh, how many of you have ever met Jeb Bush? Okay, I have found in my experience that people who meet him don't care who his father is or who his brother is, and he is the only Republican in national politics today who Democrats, to a person who I meet, who know him and have met him, say, "I like him, I respect him, I think he'd be a good president." If you think about our politics today and how polarized it is, that's extraordinary. Now, there's some Republicans who say that about Hillary Clinton, which is why she's somewhat formidable. I also think it is true that at a time when the country is still searching for kind of fundamental change, a, a Clinton-Bush general election doesn't necessarily leave us to that. <laughs> but, but they are both high-minded, concerned with the country, experienced, interested in trying to heal some of the breaches that have developed that the last three presidents haven't. If Jeb decided to run and his heart was in it, and I think in the end he won't because his heart doesn't seem in it, I think he is extremely formidable uh, as a fundraiser, as someone who could, by virtue of his record and his instincts, do tons to try to help the party with uh, non-white voters, which the party needs to do to win. Um, I think he shakes up the Electoral College as someone who could, who could who could compete in a place like New Jersey or California, potentially. And I think, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of ways to say what makes a strong presidential candidate. One way is the likability thing. Another way to think of the likability thing is, can you put them on halftime of Monday Night Football, meet the press and the Tonight Show without their staff holding its collective breath throughout the appearance? Yes, you can with Jeb Bush. And there's not many other people in the field who can do that. So I put him at the top, but I don't think he'll run. Governor Christie, you know, it's still not clear to me how he gets through this without the scandal getting closer to him and maybe much closer to him. I tend to believe people in public life when they say things in public. If he denies it, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. That's not true of most of my sources. Um, and I think it's difficult for me to see that these investigations not damaging him. If he runs, though, I think he's formidable. I think people have forgotten why not that long ago, when my magazine put him on the cover of uh, for the second time and after he won re-election, why he was thought of as the front runner. And I think if this thing hadn't happened, he would be the front runner, and and he would be the natural front runner. And I think Jeb Bush would would probably be significantly less likely even than he is now. Ryan, I don't think will run. I think I think his kids are still too young. I think he's he doesn't want to raise money. But if the others stay out, he might. Kasich is, I think, the most intriguing. Um, there's no perfect candidates. Um, Governor Kasich does not have a great attention span. That is his one flaw. He can focus on a topic for about 45 seconds. There are things that come across a president desk like Putin that require greater focus than 45 seconds. But I think uh, he, is, he is, I'd put him up there almost with Vice President Biden. I think he's just a, a likable guy. Uh, the press likes him. You know, a lot of Republicans say, you, 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 they can't win a presidential or their, their hands are tied behind their back because the press is biased against Republicans. George Bush got better press than Al Gore. George Bush got better press than John Kerry. It helps because earned media, is, media coverage is so important in a presidential race. I think John Kasich would get better coverage than Hillary Clinton. And that alone for Republicans 
is an extraordinarily positive asset to have. So I think he's underrated, assuming he wins re-election, as an establishment candidate. There are plenty of other people who might run, but I put those, those guys at the top. The other person I just want, always want to mention is Mike Huckabee. Not an establishment candidate, horrible fundraiser, very likable guy. Um, uh, you know, we've only had one president from Hope, Arkansas. I think we're overdue for another. His, his, <laughs> his, his challenge is, I think, is, is he's not an establishment candidate, and that's who the party's nominated. And I think the Clintons um, feel pretty comfortable going up against him for whatever reason. So I don't think he's, I don't think he's going to be a strong general election candidate, but I think in the right field, He'd be a pretty big. He'd be a pretty big factor. Uh, so turn it is, yeah. no, no mention of Rick Santorum in this, who is really trying to position himself out there as yeah. coming back. Look, I think that I think that Mike Pence, if he runs, Rick Perry, if he runs, Rick Santorum, if he runs, I think they're all uh, potentially taking up a lot of space. And I think the press understates the degree to which, in the right field, Senator Santorum could be a factor. I just, I just, it, it's hard for me to see how he is able to win over the kind of people who decide historically who wins the Republican nomination. In the right field, if none of these establishment people run or they or some of them, one or two of them runs, they turn out to be weaker, I could see Rand Paul being the nominee. I could see Rick Santorum being the nominee. The, the thing about the person whose turn it is goes out the window as much as we have a, you know, we don't have a front runner. There is no one. The Rick Santorum, I've been surprised at how little people credit his prospects, given what he did last time. But the fact is, last time, he largely did well because it was the weakest field in my, gener in my career, in either party. And I think he filled a vacuum. He, 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 he wasn't able to, to, to beat Mitt Romney, an extraordinarily weak candidate by many measures, in part because he had no crossover appeal to the establishment. And I think that's as important or more important in 2016 as it was in 2012. And I haven't seen him do anything to reach out. The one thing he's done, he did it at CPAC, and he did it in his speech the night of the Iowa caucuses, which was the best speech he gave in the whole campaign. He understands that the party has to talk about economic aspirations of blue-collar, middle-class voters. Almost no Republican does that. It is amazing to me when that is how you win elections. <coughs> he's done that on occasion. As I said, he did it at CPAC, got very little attention for it. But if he keeps that up and no one else has the brains to map, match it, uh, he might be able to do it. On the other hand, as we write in the book, he won't do debate prep, he won't read a prepared speech. Very hard to have message discipline if you won't do either of those two things. And I think the fact that the Iowa speech got so much great coverage and then he never mentioned his grandfather's hands again in the entire campaign speaks to what was last time and remains kind of an inability to drive a message. And that, that again, you look at, you look at Bush, uh, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, they all did that. We discussed a little bit the president's relationship with Congress, mm -hmm. um, and the we've also like touched on the relationship that presidents have with the press. Mm -hmm. um, this, I mean, from from my own experience, and and it's it's a bit more limited in terms of working with the White House, but it, it's still it, I've I've experienced it. Mm -hmm. This this White House in particular seems particularly hostile or indifferent uh, to to members of the press, um, it com particularly compared with Bush, particularly compared mm -hmm. with Clinton. Um, and another factor in the, in the sort of the power structure of Washington is that it's, it also seems very indifferent or, or antagonistic toward the lobbying community, the influence community, um, and, you know, has, has made them jump through a lot more hoops in order to get government jobs and so forth. Is how much of a factor do you think that that, that those things are too, in, in terms of like the president's ability to sort of break through on a message or, or get through, get something done in Washington? So you're lumping our profession in with the lobbyists, are you? Yeah. I think um, we are less popular. Yeah, we are a little yeah. <laughs> um, You know, both those questions are like doctoral theses that, um, <laughs> that, that hard for me. I know I'm giving pretty long answers, but, even, but I'd have to give an even long answer to really do those justice. I think that the, the press's relationship with this administration and with people in government in general are worse than they were. And that's not good for anybody. I think we have to earn it back. We have to we have to operate not as a special interest, or an elite, or an entitled group, but as people protecting the public interest, and to be less superficial. Um, but I also think that my former bureau chief Jay Carney, and some of the other people who represent the president, have recognized more than because of new media, more than any other administration, that they can go around us. You know, President Nixon went on laughing, um, but. 
the, the options of going around us are far greater now. And I just think we have to earn back the legitimacy uh, as an entity that's protecting the public interest and not people who fight with Jay Carney to get on TV. Um, difficult thing to do, but I think we have to do that. Um, I also think that um, that it's all part of this, the general freak show downward partisan spiral that that they don't want to um, ever engage in a, in a in a position of weakness and and we're uh, you know we when we ask them questions they're potentially in a position of weakness so as that hurt him I think that he certainly doesn't get um, the kind of coverage he got in 2008 when he got more favorable coverage than anyone I've ever covered and I was outspokenly critical of people in our business for not holding him accountable for a bunch of things you know the example I always give is you know, he, he said he would take uh, federal financing and uh, for the general, and then he didn't. Um, and um, I'm not a big critic of the substantive decision because I think uh, money in politics isn't a bad thing. But but he, he, he if a Republican had done something like that, I think it would, coverage would have been extraordinarily negative. So he gets more negative coverage than he did before, and I think they've not reacted well to that. I don't think he's reacted particularly well to it. No president likes negative coverage. They're all feel misunderstood. But I've been surprised at the way that some of the staff has reacted to that. But I, I, I think we bear some of the responsibility for it. In terms of lobbyists, you know, the president felt strongly as a candidate, and I think he does still in his heart, that special interests had too much influence uh, of all sorts, uh, although maybe not labor unions, but other special interests. And, um, and has tried, you know, you, you talked about how they made people jump through hoops. Some people have been critical of him for dropping the standards and letting too many lobbyists in the administration. I think that, in general, the president, and, and it's on a social level and practical level of first lady, they just don't care about official Washington very much. And there's something nice about that. But I think, uh, I think it's, it, 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 uh, it, to some extent, works against them because official Washington, as, as much as influence is reduced by some metrics, is still pretty influential and particularly uh, impacts his ability to get things done. So I think he should be, um, you know, having some lobbyists over for basketball and golf and whatever uh, to get things done. But at the same time, I, I applaud his um, keeping lobbyists at, at arm's length to the extent that it fulfills his commitment to try to have decisions made both in appearance and reality less, uh, less uh, influenced by moneyed special interests. So we're going to take questions from the audience in just a moment, but I, I will have one of my own. When I travel around the country, one of the most frequent questions I get is, you know, gosh, Washington is so broken. Is it possible this will ever get better? Will it ever get fixed? And you saw that dynamic almost immediately when President Obama took office, where Republicans said, we're not going to give him anything. He didn't get any votes on health care. They've given him very few victories. Is that dynamic going to continue no matter who is in the White House and no matter which party controls chambers? Like, is there hope for people out there who don't like what they see here? Well, you know, I get the question, too, obviously, all the time. And, and I particularly laugh when I get it from some, say, conservative who says, you know, President Obama is a horrible socialist. He's born in Kenya. He doesn't know what he's doing, undermines the military. And why can't people in Washington get along better? Why does there have to be <laughs> so much partisanship? Um, and I heard the same thing from liberals when President Bush was in office. It's, it's, it's a bit of a puzzle because the last three people we elected were committed rhetorically and based on their careers to changing this. I never thought I'd cover a president more polarizing than President Clinton, and President uh, Bush was. President Obama, by metrics, is governing in a more even a more polarized time. Um, you know, his 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 standing with the public is interesting. He's got a, a a floor, a ceiling on his support. You know, even after uh, Bin Laden was killed, his approval rating went up to about sixty mid sixties for very briefly, and then came right back down. Kind of staggering after something like that. You know, think about President Bush forty one after the Gulf War went up to in the nineties approval rating. His son after nine eleven went up into the seventies and eighties, and they sustained high long enough to get things done. President Obama went up to mid 60s right back down I, I asked after that asked myself what could he possibly do in the balance of this term or second term to go higher than that and stay high the only thing i've come up with is if he successfully repelled a martian invasion i think it's possible <laughs> Bill Pullman style. possible that that his approval rating would go up although i think sean handy would say bear, that he had, bear russell vladimir putin exactly <laughs> sean handy would say that he'd projected intergalactic weakness and that's why the martians came in um so there's that ceiling and that 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 means that he's got to constantly fight against tens of millions of people. He's also got a floor, though. You know, you think about how bad the economy's been, about, about the way some things like the health care roll has been mishandled. 
except in a very few polls, his approval rating's never gone below 40. Think about it. tough times, high unemployment, all this. 40% of the public is with him, apparently, no matter what. That floor is an extraordinary political asset. But I think it's also kind of made them hunker down because they got to keep that 40. And so he's got an incentive to, to be more partisan because if he takes a risk and reaches out and the base doesn't like it, he gets down into 30s. That's when he's in real trouble. So what, what kind of person could reach out? Again, although Hillary Clinton has at times been amongst the most polarizing people in the country, when she was a senator, she was the most bipartisan member of Congress. She worked with Republicans. She prayed with Republicans. She, um, she reached out and built relations. Jeb Bush, I think, has that same potential. Not necessarily with Democrats in Congress, but as I said before, with Democrats around the country. I think they're, they're pretty good hopes. John Kasich reaches out like crazy in Ohio and gets slapped back all the time by Democrats. I think he's an extraordinarily conciliatory figure. Again, on some policies he's pursued, they've inflamed the partisanship in that state. But if the last three guys couldn't do it, and in the wake of 9-11 and unemployment, um, it's hard to see who could do it. Now, that having been said, candidate Obama said you can't do health care in a partisan way and then did. Biggest mistake of his presidency, as far as I'm concerned, although I understand why he did it. Wanted to get health care done, wanted universal coverage, couldn't do it any other way. But, but someone who came in and was willing to take more risks, if you go back, President Clinton came in, had all Democratic Congress, turned the beginning of his presidency over to George Mitchell and Dick Gephardt. Big mistake. President Bush came in and... On edu- with the exception of education, a few other issues, basically governed in a, in a partisan way and then rode 9-11 into the midterms in 94, Republican majorities. President um, Obama came in, Democratic majorities, let Harry Reid and Nancy Pelosi write the stimulus, did health care, auto, financial regulation in almost exclusively partisan way. I think our chance lies in if Congress is controlled by the opposite party at the beginning of a presidency, and the person's instincts and political judgment is, I got no choice but to do things in a bipartisan way, risk alienating the base. It would appear that that means a Democratic president or Republican Congress, if we're talking about 2016. I think that's our best chance. If Governor Romney had won, even though Democrat, even though his party controls the House, I think Harry Reid and Governor Romney would have, President Romney would have had an extraordinary relationship, given how much they dislike each other. But that's to me, the recipe. And then it takes personality and it takes somebody willing to say to his party or her party, we're, we're, for the good of the country, we're going to change the culture by having partis- bipartisan bills. Possible to do. You know, early on, we, we faced a, sh- a th- threat of a shutdown. Um, President Obama and, we're, and Hill leaders worked out a deal that, on a spending bill that was opposed by uh, Nancy Pelosi and Michelle Bachman. Nancy Pelosi thought it cut too much. Michelle Bachman thought it cut too little. After that, I came up with my Pelosi Bachman rule. Any piece of legislation opposed by Michelle Bachman and Nancy Pelosi should pass and will pass. <laughs> and and uh, and I think, although we won't have the Michelle Bachman to to judge this, I think those kind of centrist coalitions where you have a joint whip operation, where Steny Hoyer and and uh, uh, um, and Eric Cantor and and McCarthy. Figure out how do we get to a majority. We've seen those in my career. We saw it on NAFTA. We've seen it on a few issues. It's hard to do in the current climate, but that's what it's going to take. I think we're going to open it up to some questions. This was an unusual case, both in terms of our reporting and in terms of writing about it. We didn't really want to write that it was us. We just didn't want to be part of it, but we felt we had to acknowledge it in the, in the author's note. You know, because the book interviews are embargoed till after the election, um, the, the, and we do some reporting during in real time and some after uh, the election, but before the, the embargo until after the election and when the book comes out a year later. It rarely happened in either book that our, the process of our reporting had any impact. And, and normally, when we ask questions of people, they don't go tell their colleagues what we asked about. In this case, we, we stumbled upon something that someone learned that we knew and felt compelled to tell the president. That just... If, if, if it's happened a handful of other times, but not at, not at this level and not to the extent to which it, it created actual newsmaking events. So it was unfortunate. We weren't, we weren't pleased about it. Um, and a lot of what we write up in the book, we didn't know in real time. Um, and so, uh, I mean, we knew the basic fact that the president found out and he was unhappy, but we didn't know about the meeting and the walkout and all of that until later. So 
I don't, we don't worry about it because that didn't happen very much. This one case was not ideal, but um, but it was it was manageable. And it's it is just you know, people ask all the time about the difference between the first book and the second book. It was a little bit harder to do some of the things in the second book. In some ways, it was easier. But you know, like if we had an interview in the White House and we were walking down the West. West Wing driveway sometimes that would be tweeted or blogged and that that's not ideal for reporters trying to write quiet do quiet reporting um and and in the case of of the list that again wasn't ideal from our point of view because we don't want to be part of the story and because we didn't want the the we don't never want our work in progress the fruits of our work in progress to be discussed by others that's a lot of that's a lot of questions. You're testing my memory. Let's see if I can if I can remember them all. Um, uh, you know, uh, Justice Ginsburg has had health problems. I think I think that you 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 might one might think that the one of the Democratic justices or more who are thinking of retiring would retire soon um, in order to let President Obama nominate their. Uh, replacement. On the other hand, given the makeup of the Senate, even now, let alone after the midterms, you'd have a huge battle that might sap the strength, you know, the attention and strength of the administration and, and, and ruin any prospect of cooperation on immigration or energy or anything else. So I'm not sure if, the, if they're going to base their retirement decision on politics that they necessarily would retire at this point, although it doesn't necessarily look like it would be brighter down the road. In terms of the midterms, um, I don't really run counter to the conventional wisdom. I think that the the um, people who look at any of the Democratic incumbent senators or Democratic held seats outside um, uh, the three that are most commonly thought of as going um, Democratic or Republican, uh, but I'm talking about the next tier of Arkansas and North Carolina, Louisiana, Alaska. Anyone who looks at those as gone, I think it's just silly because if you have an incumbent who doesn't have a scandal, who's raising money, and who um, and who is fighting for their job, and that's true of all those Democratic incumbents, is very hard to beat them without an A candidate. An A candidate and a tide can beat them. Now, we may have a tide so big on the Republican side that a B candidate can do it. I'm not convinced that even, even Congressman Cotton is an A candidate yet. He might be, but I'm not convinced for sure that he is. And the DSCC is really well run and is not... Uh, um, uh, complacent about what it's going to take to try to win these races. I think energy and passion matter a lot in the midterms, and the Democrats have not found energy and passion about anything. And, you know, they're talking about Senate votes on minimum wage and other things. Those are important issues. I'm not sure that those get you the energy and passion to change the makeup of the midterm electorate. So I would say today that I think Democrats will lose the Senate. Uh, if, if it were today, I think they would. And I think they may lose 10 seats um, if there's a national tide. And I think there could be. But I'm not, I'm not that into predicting. But I think that's a more likely outcome. North of six seats is a more likely outcome for sure than fewer. And I think maybe substantially more than six. I don't see in the end, unless um, Ms. Nunn turns out to be an extraordinarily good candidate, I don't see that Democrats picking up any seats. And I think they could lose quite a few. The um, the Republicans have some primaries still. I think people have over uh, over um, estimated the chances that the Speaker in North Carolina is going to be the nominee. I'm not sure that's the case. I want to see how, what happens in the Georgia primary. I want to see what happens in the Iowa primary before I'm willing to to talk about uh, those races with any certainty. But I think I think Michigan, Colorado, New Hampshire, all could be in play, um, and and that's a big playing field to be playing defense in in a year where there could be a tide. House, you know, I think Republicans at this point would pick up seats. I think as much as the country's unhappy with the with Congress and the mood of the country, I think the the, the just sort of the dynamics of the districts are such that they're not going to have um, they're not going to have too much trouble. Uh, Governor Huntsman I think would like to be president. I think he'd like to run again. I think he as the book shows, he was he was a horrible candidate uh, in part because he didn't know what he stood for. He 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 was an establishment centrist candidate who wasn't willing to enunciate that in its full voice in a way that I think would have allowed him to stand out in the field. He chose not to. And um, and that uh, made him relatively weak. I've seen in my career people who were weak first time candidates who were stronger the next time. And I think in the right mix of candidates, he could he could be a factor. I still think um, in today's Republican Party, I have trouble raising money. He's not a very good fundraiser. 
Um, I may be forgetting one of your questions, but I love Joe Scarborough. <laughs> I will uh, give a little plug to rollcall.com. You can see all of those race ratings on our politics page. We've got a great story up about the Iowa Republican field that might run against Bruce Braley. Really interesting. Just went up this afternoon, so follow all of that there. I feel like I've neglected this side of the room. Uh, back right there. Yeah. Okay. You know, I'm, I'm a big <laughs> believer in uh, Yogi Berra, the political philosopher, uh, his creed that says prediction is difficult, especially about the future. So <laughs> I try to stay away from predicting. I will say regarding the president, I thought Governor Romney would be the nominee the whole time, um, uh, assuming no one else like Chris Christie or some other establishment candidate got in. I never wavered from that, um, with, with the exception, uh, which the book shows was an exception for a lot of people, was after he lost uh, Colorado, um, Missouri, and uh, Minnesota, I think I have those states right, to Santorum on one day. I thought there was some chance, you know, he, at that point it was irrational to be certain he'd be the nominee. He was behind in Michigan and Ohio. So except, except for that one moment, I didn't waver from that. And I never wavered from thinking the president would win uh, for two related reasons. One is I'm a big believer in the likability factor and the hang on the corner factor. And Governor Romney is extraordinarily likable in person, but his inability to convey that through the medium of television and in living rooms in Iowa and New Hampshire, for whatever reason, um, is uh, is was palpable to me, and I just thought he'd never trump the president. And the other thing was, the president's advisors made it clear they were going to run the Bush 2004 playbook to disqualify him, uh, and you know he would not talk about the so-called three M's of Mormonism, money, and uh, Massachusetts. So he was allowing them to define him on their terms as a you know a cross between Thurston Howell the third and um, and uh, Gordon Gecko, and and that that. I just I never I never thought he would it would be a fair fight on personality and I think if you look at the races in the television era with one or possibly two exceptions the more likable persons won every presidential race. The most obvious exception is is uh, you know I defy you to live off the difference of who's more likable Gerald Ford or Jimmy Carter but uh, <laughs> otherwise what about 68? Um I mean in 68 Nixon was pretty likable. You might not you might not have liked him but you know that's that's uh, that's uh, that's a, a little bit of a judgment call. Two thousand, also Gore and Bush. Gore won the popular vote. I think I think he's probably less likable, but there are, there are exceptions. But I think uh, I think the, the the in the main that's that's been what sol settled these. And, and I just never thought, as much as the president's poll numbers were down, uh, he, his likability was still pretty high. People still like him. I think if she if she if she runs, a big factor will be the amount of awareness amongst women throughout the country and some men that if you want a woman president this is a chance the gap between her and other prominent women who people talk about about pre presidential candidates is immense in terms of the metrics we use to judge candidates fundraising name id national and international experience so um i think republicans will have a lot of challenges in terms of beating her if she's the nominee um and the gender gap would just be an immense problem for them and and they'd have to try to make inroads with female voters, but I think they'd have to try to do what Republicans generally do, which is to run up the score as much as they could with men. She does have greater strength amongst women than men, and, and they may be able to exploit that. Um, but I think in terms of volunteers and donors and um, endorsements uh, from business people, uh, female business people, I think she'd it'd be an incredible asset for her. And I think, unlike last time when, when some of his, her advisors urged her to not emphasize that as part of her message, I think she would emphasize it. I'll say parenthetically, I think one of the biggest problems for her is what her message will be, what her forward-looking message will be beyond that. Uh, but I think that'd clearly be part of it. On climate, you know, sh she's she's a related problem is, you know, what is, she, what is her view of a lot of the big issues that um, President Obama either hasn't dealt with or has dealt with and been criticized by the left or right or both? And I think I think it, it, on that and, and most of the other newsmaking pronouncements she's made since leaving the government, I think she's mostly just speaking her mind and maybe tentatively feeling out where uh, safe ground is politically, but more speaking her mind. And I don't think I don't I don't see in it, um, you know, nothing with the Clintons ever happens in a linear fashion. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite Bill Clinton expressions is um, not his originally, but he likes to say, if you see a turtle on a fence post, you know, it didn't get there by itself. Um, but in these cases, I think, I think she is just mostly just kind of out there answering questions and saying what she, what she wants to say and not trying to 
position or, or manipulate or maneuver yet. Could everybody hear the question in the back? Yeah. No. The question was, is, is Double Down available on Amazon right now? <laughs> is that a, a good paraphrase? Yeah. yeah. It is available. The question is, what can the president and his advisors do to try to break the gridlock and move things forward? You know, it, very difficult. I, you know, it seems as if from the strategy that they've worked up with the Hill Democrats that they're going to spend this year doing what they spent the end of 2011 and all of 2012 doing, which is positioning to try to do better in the midterms. I think it's, it's, it's possible that if the economy improves, if they get their, a few breaks in some of these primaries on the Republican side, if some of the nominees uh, or likely nominees on the Republican side turn out to be weaker than, than they seem, if they can win some of the big governor's races, I think they think you know 2015 can be brighter and they can, and they can move forward. They won't have the House. And so I think it's a little bit, my view is it's a little bit of a waste because you know, beating up John Boehner and the Republicans for the rest of the year, the fever is not going to break in 2015 any more than it broke in, in 2013. Um, you know, I think the president should, should try to find bipartisan compromises and start meeting with Republicans on a regular basis. You know, part of why he stopped meeting with Republicans is because he met with Mitch McConnell once and John Boehner a few times and nothing changed. And his attitude was, I'm not going to waste my time. I meet with them and nothing changes. Why should I keep meeting with them? You know, if I were them, I'd meet with the Republican leadership every week. Just bring them in and talk. Even if it's unproductive at first, he's got to have personal relations. The only way in the current system where all the incentives for politicians are to fight and to be partisan, the only way to, to, to contribute to breaking that, I think, is interpersonal relationships. And I think that's really what they have to try. And then look for opportunities, like on immigration in particular, to keep the muscles moving. The Patty Murray, uh, Paul Ryan deal shows that even people who disagree and are, you know, pretty staunchly partisan, if you put them in the room, if you find common ground, if you talk about options, if you're willing to sacrifice and compromise on some things, you can get deals. And I think on his remaining big issues, and he's accomplished a lot already, but it's on the remaining big issues. I think that's the, the only prospect for change is a, that kind of personal understanding that the country doesn't have time to waste. It's going to be tough. If they, if they spend this year doing politics, the window, regardless of the results of the midterms, the window between the midterms and the presidential freezing things, it's not very big. You know, she's like an incumbent in many ways. And if you look at the last three incumbent presidents, all of whom have won re-election, only the second time in the country's history we've had three straight two-term presidents, it's... In large part, I think the factor number one, and this is not just my view, but the view of a lot of people who worked for those presidents, avoiding a primary, a nomination challenge is a huge advantage. It doesn't force you ideologically to the wing, the extreme wing of your party. It allows you to raise and spend money all with an eye on the general election. It allows you to be above the fray. Tons of advantages to that. So I think she's better off without a challenge. You know, she's got a hold on not just fundraising, which is obviously a huge part of getting elected and nominated, but a hold on every constituency in the party. Labor likes her, gay and lesbians like her. African Americans like her, Hispanics like her, young people like her, women like her. Um, there's a there's a there's a, a a fool's errand to go after her at this point and try to beat her. Now, if somebody ran against her, you could imagine a world, and her strategists are very much concerned about this. You can imagine a world where she wins primary seventy thirty, and the headline is you know Clinton loses thirty percent of the vote. Um, you know psychological defeat, you know symbolic defeat. So. I think they will do their best, to, if she runs, to keep everybody out. Because, because as popular as she is, 70-30 is a, is, a, is a romp, but again, it could be it cast in a different light. Um, I don't, you name some of the people, I'd add Howard Dean to the list as possibly running against her, Governor Schweitzer maybe, but in the end, if she runs and if she does it right, if she plays her inside politics right, if, she's, if she does her fundraising right, if she's got a super PAC that's, you know, and a research operation ready to kill anyone who runs against her. If she courts anyone who's talking about running, you know, Al Gore kept everybody but Bill Bradley out of the race. And a lot of people wanted to be in that race. If she does her politics like Gore did, but not have that one person against her, I think she can keep everybody out of the race. And that would be just a mammoth advantage, particularly if you contrast it with what a fractious fight the Republicans are almost certainly going to have. 
All right. I mean, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, you'll, you'll be around for a few more minutes. I uh, wanted to mention our next Roll Call Book Club is coming up in a short window, two weeks. Um, and we're going to be reading The Centrist Manifesto. More about it on our website, rollcall.com. Um, thank you so much, Mark. Thank you all I for hosting me. I really appreciate it. it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bellantoni. Thank you.